In our previous two videos, we saw an overview of the Salesforce platform's application architecture, and we did a deep dive into its data layer. Now let's get a little bit more granular still and talk about query processing. Most modern database systems determine their query execution plans by using an optimizer that considers relevant statistics about the table and index data. But that approach is designed for single tenant applications and it really doesn't account for the data access characteristics of a user executing a query in a multi-tenant environment. So in order to provide sufficient statistics for determining optimal query execution, the Salesforce platform maintains a set of statistics at the tenant, group, and user level for every org's objects. These statistics represent the number of rows that a particular query can potentially access. And they take into account org-specific object statistics, like the total number of rows owned by an org as a whole. And they also take more granular statistics into account, like the number of rows that a user potentially has access to based on their permissions. And the query optimizer uses internal security-related tables to determine a user's access rights for objects and rows. The platform also maintains other types of statistics for certain queries, such as the cardinality of values in a pick list, or the number of unique values in a field. Let's take a look at what the underlying process looks like when the system receives a request for data. Now, a request can originate from any number of sources, such as an API call or a stored procedure, for example. And when the platform receives the request, it executes a set of pre-queries that consider the statistics I mentioned earlier, along with a bunch of others as well. Then, based on the results returned by those pre-queries, the system builds an optimal underlying database query for execution. And then as a final step, the system executes the query and returns the results back to the requester. Now, I mentioned this in the two previous videos as well, but just to reiterate, the functionality that I talked about in this video is not something that you can change as an architect. But having a good understanding of how this functionality works will help you make better decisions when it comes to the things that you do have control over. And it'll also make some of the topics we cover in the Salesforce Well-Architected framework a little bit more clear. This was also just a high-level overview of these concepts. Make sure to check out the Platform Multi-Tenant Architecture document and the Well-Architected framework for a deeper dive. You can find both of them on the Salesforce Architects website, and I also linked them below. Now, if you found this content to be useful, make sure to like and subscribe, and I am looking forward to seeing you next time.